Good afternoon and welcome uh, to this today's panel discussion on designing trustworthy data systems for 21st century public health. And warm welcome to today's panelists, Megan Dorr, Dr. Lisa Lee, and Dr. Kim McGrail. My hope is that our discussion will highlight a few important threads and tensions in a much larger emerging conversation about the governance of health data, where we've been, where we are today, and where we might go. My name is Flavia Chen. I go by she, her pronouns, and I'm a TAP fellow. Before we begin, I'd like to extend my deep gratitude to the staff of the Technology and Public Purpose Project at the Belper Center, especially Laura Manley, Karen Ejifor, Amritha Jayanti, as well as to my co-TAP fellows for all their assistance in putting together today's event. I also acknowledge the Massachusetts tribe from whose ancestral homeland I join you today. I honor the past, present, and future indigenous peoples and leaders. Before we get started, I'll note that today's event is being recorded and will be made available online for later viewing. Despite the virtual setting, we hope this will be an interactive event. We encourage you in our audience to send your questions using Zoom's Q&A feature, and the panelists will engage with your questions during the last 15 minutes or so of today's event. To get everyone in the spirit of participation and to better frame the conversation, um, I'd like to ask our audience members to please take a minute to respond to this brief poll that I'll just put up. And as we're waiting for poll responses to come in, um, I'll ask our panelists to please uh, join me on the virtual stage. Wonderful, we're seeing, seeing the numbers rise. And this is super helpful for us since we can't see your faces just to know who we're speaking with. So looks like the numbers have sort of settled out. We have a good representation from healthcare. Nobody who self identifies as being in public health. Um, we have a few in tech, education, government, few self-employed, few others. Uh, and on a scale of one to five, familiarity uh, with the topic of public health data governance is fairly high, uh, between three and a four, I would think. So thank you for that. Um, we'll keep these uh, results in mind as, um, as we have this conversation and hopefully we won't you know, use too much jargon unexplained, but it will be a good reminder to us um, if we do so. So without further ado, um, I invite our panelists to please introduce yourselves and the perspectives um, that you bring to today's discussion. Um, how about we start with Meg? Hi everyone, I'm Meg Doerr uh, from Sage Bio Networks. I um, uh, an associate director there, and I focus on applied LC research. Um, so researching about research um, and with a focus on public health. Thank you. And uh, Lisa? Hello, everyone. I'm Lisa Lee. I'm coming to you from Virginia Tech in beautiful Blacksburg, Virginia. I'm an infectious disease epidemiologist, a surveillance scientist, and a public health ethicist. I've worked um, in at both the state and the federal and actually and the international level, um, working with surveillance, public health surveillance, um, worked for many years at CDC. Um, Virginia Tech, as I mentioned, is located in Blacksburg, Virginia. It's the ancestral home of the Tudelo and Monacan people who are the traditional custodians of the land on which I work and live. And I recognize uh, their continued connection to the land, the water and the air that Virginia Tech consumes. And I do pay respect to their elders past, present and emerging. I also want to acknowledge the university's historical ties to the indentured and enslaved people whose labors built our university. I'm really looking forward to the discussion today and I come to it uh, with the perspective of a public health surveillance scientist, and a public health ethicist um, who's, who's had uh, experience at, at these three levels in public health for more than 25 years. Thank you, Flavia, for inviting me to be here. Thank you, Lisa and Kimberlyn. Hi, I'm uh, Kim McGrail and I'm a professor in the School of Population and Public Health at the University of British Columbia, which is in Vancouver, uh, Canada. Um, and I am speaking with you from the uh, traditional and unceded territories of the Musqueam, Tsleil-Waututh and uh, Squamish First Nations. Um, I am 
uh, in addition to being a, a professor who has a, a background in quantitative health services policy research, uh, I am also the scientific director of Population Data BC, which is a provincial based research data resource um, that includes public sector information from all, many, many different um, government ministries and researcher collected data and so on. Um, and also scientific director of Health Data Research Network Canada, which is uh, similar to pop data, but what it's trying to do is to unite similar data resources across the country. So we're uh, a research, so I definitely come with a research perspective to this conversation and, and really looking forward to the next hour. Wonderful, thank you all so much. And I think that we've already seen sort of, uh, you guys have a little slice into my, my wanting to bring these uh, wonderful guests on here today to have both the clinical perspective, you know, Meg is a, a uh, genetic counselor, I think, by training, and you know that I think informs her LC perspective. Having the research uh, perspective, you know, Kim, a lot of your research, as I understand it, leverages uh, partnerships across, you know, across sectors, across uh, research institutes, and then obviously Lisa, with your uh, tremendous experience in governmental public health, I hope I can draw these connections out over the course of this conversation. And uh, just to note, you know, our fourth panelist who is supposed to be here with us today, Dr. Stephanie Russo Carroll is obviously unable to make it. Um, she had a family emergency and we send her and her family our best wishes. Um, we'll miss her voice on the panel. And um, Dr. Russo Carroll has uh, sent along a list of several readings in case anyone is interested in exploring the topics she would have discussed um, on your own time. And I just wanted to flag that she has an LC Friday forum uh, presentation scheduled in May on the topic of genomics and data sovereignty. And so I'll, um, if I can copy and paste this very quickly, I'll put information in the chat and I encourage you to register uh, for that event if you're interested in available. Uh, and for the reading list, you can just email me and I can send it, uh, send it around. So let's see if this works here. Okay. Um, so those LC Friday forums are, are a lot of fun. Um, and so I look forward to joining that event also. So let's dig into today's topic. Um, thanks to COVID, uh, data, data systems, and, um, and public health, uh, to be frank, are much more in our collective consciousness. And um, I think that we've been learning a lot about sort of the infrastructure most recently, you know, needed to trace genomic variants as they evolve around the world. Um, and as the vaccine rollout started in the US, many of us were shocked um, by how uncoordinated distribution appeared, even in light of the sort of data gaps and aggregation challenges, reporting challenges that we saw in, early in the pandemic um, as incomplete data from the state, local, territorial, and tribal levels began to paint this picture of the disparate toll that the pandemic was exacting. And at the federal level, we saw that HHS, the parent uh, head of the CDC, struggled also with data aggregation and ultimately had to resort to uh, massive no-bid industry contracts um, in an attempt to assemble one coherent uh, system out of all these disparate data streams. So I found myself asking, how did we end up here? And this is sort of the provocation for today's conversation. My background is in public health genetics. And so I think I was primed to see parallels with conversations going on in genetics uh, about data sharing, about patient and uh, participant engagement, about data governance, about ethics. And so I thought we would uh, start this conversation and sort of frame it in three parts. You know, one about the past, where, where are we coming from? How do we find ourselves where we did at the beginning of the pandemic? The present uh, that we're seeing, you know, the, uh, an influx of sort of non-traditional maybe data sources um, that are uh, at our fingertips that we're being told it's, you know, time to leverage these alternate data streams and then about the future. Now that uh, uh, as the sort of teaser for this event showed, uh, the Biden administration has uh, earmarked funds for the modernization of public health uh, data infrastructure, which is a very welcome thing. There are a lot of people who are uh, eager to get going on this project, but what really does that entail and how do we capitalize on this moment where we know that in the past, you know, public health funding often goes cyclically, we're often, it's a boom and bust cycle and, um, I guess I don't want to frame a conversation out of fear, but I don't, I don't want to repeat the past. I want this to be a learning experience. Um, and so that's sort of my, uh, my theme from the outset. 
So Lisa, I thought we might start with you first, given your um, many hats that you've worn uh, in governmental public health, as well as you know, your background in ethics um, and epidemiology. How would you describe, how do you conceptualize what's going on with uh, data governance in public health at this moment? Well, again, thank you so much for the invitation to be here. I'm really looking forward to our conversation. Um, and I, I think the, you know, my initial response to how do I frame this um, has to do really with the past, the present and the future. And I will start by saying some things from the past have, have changed a lot in our present and will continue to change in our future. And some things will stay the same. And one of the, the things, I mean, I think we're, we're all aware of what those um, changing things are. I mean, the way we collect data, the way we access data, um, the, the re how readily available many disparate screens of data are available to public health uh, is different that, you know, we have electronic reporting and electronic data capture now and stored where, you know, when I started in public health surveillance, um, you know, in, in the uh, previous ice age, um, I we did paper pencil, you know, uh, collection of data and hand entered it into a DOS based system. You know, it was when we got computers, it was a pretty big deal. Um, so I, I will say that 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 those pieces of the data collection, storage, and use and sharing those things have changed. But but something that's really important that hasn't changed that I really think we need to recognize in public health and, and many of us uh, who work in public health do, which is the, the purpose of the data that we collect in public health is to take care of our patient. And our patient in public health is our community, is the community, the state, the population for which we have an ethical and legal obligation to, whose, whose health we have an ethical and legal obligation to protect. And so when we talk about how we do that and what kind of data we need in order to do those, to meet those obligations, we have to recognize that there are a whole bunch of different kinds of ways we learn about health. Research is one way. Uh, re when we do research, we ask participants to take on risk related to benefits to someone else, not to themselves. So that, that's a, often one way. We do, we do many kinds of health surveys in public health where we want just to have a sense of what's happening in the nation, what's happening uh, to make estimates for certain kinds of behaviors, health behaviors or health outcomes. And another way we do it is through vital statistics. We use death records and birth records and matching of those to think about the ways that um, you know, health affects both life and death. And finally, in my area, uh, we use public health surveillance data. And these data are different than research data. They're different than vital statistics data. They're different than survey data. And how are they different? Well, they have always been different and they will continue to be different. They really serve as the diagnostic test for our patient. So if you think about going to a clinician, you fall, you have real bad pain in your arm, you go to the healthcare provider and they say, wow, I, I, I should diagnose if you have a break or not, or if it's just a sprain. They take an x-ray and they say, yeah, looks like there's a break there, we'll cast it up and get it going. That x-ray is the diagnosis of what needs to be treated. And for public health, we use disease reporting and public health surveillance as the x-ray for our um, diagnosis. What are we dealing with? Who, where, when? These are questions, person, place, thing that we ask in epidemiology. The way we find that out is often through public health surveillance, the routine ongoing collection of data. Now, these data are collected differently than they used to be collected, but they're used and they're, 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 their um, purpose stays the same. We don't go to hospital basements anymore and, and go to the medical record room and copy down by paper, but we have case reporting or behavioral reporting or public health surveillance systems that now do that electronically. That doesn't make, however, the surveillance system. Just collecting data is not public health surveillance. Their surveillance is, is, like I said, it is a diagnostic tool and collection of data is one part of it, but use of the data is even more important. We have to be able to put those data back to use, just like we put the data for the x-ray back to use for that patient, we have to use the data we collect in public health surveillance as a diagnostic tool to do something for the population we're looking for. 
platform. So that's one thing that I think will stay the same as long as we, we um, do public health. Um, and while we, the way we collect and store and transfer data will be different, um, the fact that we need to use surveillance data to diagnose our communities and, and act um, is something that really will change. Thank you so much for that great uh, sort of foundational uh, introduction. And I, I just want to flag that I want to come back to, you know, something that you talked about, like the, the data collection is not the same as public health surveillance. And I think, you know, something that I was very happy to see in uh, Biden's uh, discussion of what this future of public health should entail is an investment in the people to actually do the what with the data. Um, and I think oftentimes, you know, in this in our big data um, obsession, we can lose sight of the fact that you still have to have people to do what with it. Um, so we'll, we'll come back to that. Um, Kim, maybe we can uh, turn to you next. Um, from your perspective in Canada, you know, I, I think one thing, you know, Lisa sort of touched on, maybe we'll also come back to is uh, the sort of federalism in public health, right? That we have 50 states, we have one figure, not figurehead, we have one organizing uh, entity in the CDC that sort of runs uh, public health surveillance. Um, how is that similar in Canada? How is that different? And how do you conceptualize uh, the project of data governance for public health from your perspective? Yeah, there's so many things to um, pick up on and, and what Lisa's already said plus your, your um, question. So maybe I'll just provide a little bit of, of context on the, the, we have some of the similar challenges of federalism that exists in the US. Um, and maybe I should also acknowledge that I grew up in the US. I'm from um, Kalamazoo, Michigan, originally. Um, so Canada is comprised of 10 provinces and three territories. Um, and we do, of course, have a federal government. But we have a, a constitutional separation of powers that give provinces um, not complete jurisdiction, but a lot of jurisdiction over the delivery of health and human related services. The federal government retains things like um, a, a, a function similar to the FDA. Um, so the approval of, of drugs and technology assessments and so on. Um, so it is a challenge because you have this kind of competing priority where the federal government wants to be able to speak about something from the standpoint of the entire country. But the fact is that the delivery and the, the maintenance of a public health practice is happening in the local jurisdictions. So that already creates both a need, um, and I think this is part of the challenge of data governance, it's both that need to have data that are reflective of the local needs and experiences, but that can also roll up into those higher levels of aggregation. And those the data that you need at those different levels might be a little bit different um, in their flavor or their um, sent, uh, disaggregated nature or the, the detail that they have, but you certainly need um, those data at multiple levels from the very um, specific region to a state or province up to the federal government. So if I kind of go to um, the other question you asked about how do I think about data governance in general, I, I, I would say um, that data governance really is the means by which we determined uh, what data are important, um, how they're going to be organized, and who can have access to them under what circumstance, for what purpose, and through what technology or, or system, uh, et cetera. Um, I think that the other piece, pieces of data governance that are really important, um, well, I, I'll just stick with one at this point, is that it really should be a team sport. Like this, the, the, the process and function of data governance doesn't rest with one individual or even one type of individual or organization. It really needs to be spread um, across a, a bunch of, of different types of people, including um, the public. Um, and I just wanna pick up on the, the surveillance um, data discussion that, that Lisa um, started engaging in, which I think is just so interesting. And I love the analogy of the, the community as the patient and the surveillance data as diagnosis. It's, then of course, we also need to think about the treatment that comes from the diagnosis and surveillance data can be useful there as well. Um, and, and the interesting thing to me in um, the context of the last year is the new kinds of data that were being discussed and brought into using this, maybe more in some other countries than in Canada, but for example, 
um, data from cell phones that show, or, or from contact tracing apps or, or whatever they might have been that show movement, contact, and actually were, became a tool in some cases for public health surveillance, for contact tracing, for notification and so on. So I think there's, there's um, the, the basics that Lisa described are there, but some of the interactions between the pipe private and public sector and the kinds of data that we have at our disposal and the way we think about what data might be useful to us, I think are changing relatively rapidly because things are becoming more digitized. So it's an, it's an interesting and important challenge. Um, so maybe I'll leave it there for now, but there's an awful lot that we can. That's wonderful. And I'm just flagging for myself this uh, public private distinction. Um, you know, I think that that gets back to what Lisa said earlier about like, you know, the data don't stand on their own. It's how they're used. And if we're thinking about governance as sort of the who, the what, the why, under what terms and conditions people have access to it, then we really need to start thinking about like, you know, has that changed uh, anything within the practice of sort of governmental public health about like, how are we, how are we bringing in this information? I know technically we can, we can have a nice conversation about uh, electronic case reporting and the sort of the incentives and challenges that have made the transition to the electronic health record, even in hospitals, sort of fraught and slow. And then getting that uh, into public health has been a, a pickle of its own. And now we're thinking about expanding, uh, you know, what constitutes public health data. Uh, it's going to be a really big project. And I think that's why data governance, this conversation is so important. Um, so Meg, how about you? Um, well, I'm really excited about this conversation to like, I need to go in like a million different directions at once here. So. So Lisa was talking about what's new and what's not new. And I, I would add to what's new um, is human mobility. So to Kim's points about who has regulatory authority over public health, you know, constitutionally in the United States, the founders made a very specific decision to allocate those powers to local jurisdictions, right? States and then states actually, many states allocated them even to smaller um, jurisdictions than that. And then and then we have, then we have this massive globalization, right? And and suddenly people are traveling all over the world. I mean, I think about my January of 2020 when I met my Chinese collaborators in Hawaii, and then I flew across the country to Washington D.C., and then I flew back to Seattle, Washington, and then I flew overseas to Europe. I mean, I could literally be the super spreader event of the year, right? And and that, I mean. I was a resident of Seattle, Washington. I am a US national, but I was all over the place. And that was not really that unusual, right? That's not an unusual month for me, or it wasn't an unusual month for me. And so as I traveled, who had authority over my health? Because would they have seen from my you know, athletic watch data that my run times were slowing down, my mile times were getting longer, um, that I was using more of my asthma medication. Would they have seen from the GPS location of my phone, all of the different jurisdictions I was visiting? I mean, I think we need to really think differently about public health. Our, our mission is the same, um, but our remit is, is much, broader, much, much broader. Um, and, and it needs to be informed by, um, you know, novel data sources, although I would say, you know, step count data, like, honestly, people give out step count things as part of, you know, health and wellness programs at, at workplaces, like that's not new to most people. But being able to weave together those data threads, and be able to do so in a much less hyper local way um, in a much broader context, I think is really what I would hope for um, as we think towards the future of, um, of public health. And certainly, you know, those, those lived experience data, the data that comes from watches and phones and, and all of the other um, IoT things that we interact with every day are making a difference in my research now um, in helping me understand um, more granularly people's lived experience, right? So not just having um, clinical encounters being the two time points that I have on, on a patient with Parkinson's disease, but to have um, granular data over time about their walking or their, um, or their speech patterns. Um, that can really be very powerful when we start to think about treatment and, um, 
advancing our understanding of disease. So I'll, I'll leave it there. Um, I'm sure there's more. Uh, well, I think, you know, something that I heard coming out of what you said, uh, Meg, is this concept of like what counts as data, right? And, um, and who has, this gets back to data governance, who has the, uh, the power to define what a data element is, the veracity of it, you know, I think that uh, some of your work on, um, uh, was it on mHealth, like mm -hmm. on, on mHealth technologies, I wonder if you could just like describe for the people in the audience who maybe haven't read your work in that field, like how is that challenging? What counts as uh, health data? Yeah, so, I mean, I think right now we're in this um, this awkward adolescence with the data that we use for health um, because we have super regulated health data, traditional health data, right? You go to the doctor, you get your X-ray, you um, have those data, which are, you know, I would say, perhaps over-regulated. Um, and then, then we have like the wild west <laughs> of, of all of the other data that's collected about us, which vastly outweighs the clinical data that we collect about people. When you look at the size of the data sets, when you look at the breadth of the data sets, when you look at the depth of the data sets, that IoT data is, is massive and so potentially informative about people's health. Um, especially in an acute crisis like a pandemic, right? Um, those digital traces, I think, can be um, uh, uh, really valuable insights. Uh, at the same time, though, you know, to Kim's point about it being a team sport, data governance being a team sport, I think we're only beginning to see glimmers of public awareness about these massive generally speaking, private data troves um, and how they're being used. Um, and, and so I feel like there's a, a gap in the regulation. I think there's a gap in our recognition of what the data types are and also a gap in the public discourse about the use of those data. Well, I think you just flagged a research agenda for <laughs> everybody on this call for the next you know decade or so. I think you're absolutely right. and. Um, you know, one thing that I had in my mind before this call was just, you know, how health, how health data, depending on the context under which it's collected, can lead to very different sort of regulatory paradigms, right? And I don't think it's surprising that um, myself included at the start of this pandemic, I was like, you know, why are we not able to distribute uh, COVID tests in the appropriate, you know, to, to the need of the populations? Um, and so, I guess where I'm going with this is like, you know, the power that comes with these big data troves. Um, I, I'm a little skeptical of, um, you know, just the benevolence of a, of a private company to say like, oh, we've, you know, we're collecting this data. We didn't really ask you whether that was okay to begin with. But when you have it now and there's researchers who are starting to say that it might be potentially useful. So we'll just continue on that pathway. Meanwhile, you know, a, a lot of thought went into what data are collected within the, uh, under the umbrella of public health. Right, uh, and I think that there was uh, historically, anyway, very a very judicious eye not to collect more than you needed, um, and this gets back to the data governance conversation um, because there was this potential for misuse. And as a matter of public trust, we're not, you know, the uh, CDC is not asking for an eye into your cell phone. Wasn't historically asking for an eye into your cell phone record to see, you know, how many steps you were walking, or are you taking care of yourself. So there's this tension here between you know, our sort of data collected, we think that it's an individual thing, but then public health is a population uh, paradigm. So any insights from you, from the panelists about how to reconcile this tension about whose data and how is it being used? I think, I think that's an excellent question and, and, it, and actually is the crux of what we're talking about in terms of the data governance. I, I think a, a lot of it depends on the purpose of the data collection and the purpose or the use of the data because, you know, in public health surveillance, one of the, the fundamental um, foundational values that we, we talk about is to collect the only the amount of data that's necessary to complete the purpose of the system. We don't want, you know, Apple or Android to download, you know, everybody's data from everybody like that is not we, we are not we don't want to swim in the lake of, of data that just we can use at any time we, we want to be able to have 
a purpose and collect the data necessary for that purpose. We especially want that because public health surveillance does not rely on individual consent. It is um, a community that consents to public health surveillance data being collected through their governance process, through their legislators, through the uh, passing of, of laws that require that. So we, we really do have um, an obligation to collect the least amount necessary for the purpose. Now that's only for that one stream of data that is public health surveillance. Researchers, on the other hand, have a whole different ethical perspective and, and survey scientists and survey researchers have a whole different perspective again. And so we really have to be thinking carefully, not just about um, you know, our, what, what it is we collect and from whom we collect, but what is the reason we're doing it? And the reason that that's important is because of what Meg said, where we have, we have such a fragmented privacy and data protection policy approach in this country. When your library books checking out are much more protected than a lot of other data. It's just, it's, it's this very odd um, lack of comprehensive protections for our data, which is very different than the EU. Um, and, uh, you know, we just, we don't have that in the US. And so every way in which we use data gets its own little set of protections, which is really hard. Um, and super hard for public health because not only do we do surveillance in public health, we also do research. That's really an important piece. It informs a lot of the work we do. It's really important, but it's based on a different set of ethical foundations. In research, often we wanna collect everything possible because we're not really sure what's gonna fit and what's gonna predict what. That is not how we design a surveillance system. It is, however, how we design a research project. So we really have to think, given the constraints of our haphazard privacy and data protection approach in the US, um, we really have to think about those things as we go about asking people to trust the government with their data. Yeah, and, and to your point, Lisa, I think a really important uh, piece here is, you said there's not individual consent for public health surveillance, there's this community will, right? And I think that that's one of the things that people fail to recognize about mobile health data, you know, data from these devices that are attached to our bodies or carried with us all the time, is that they tell not only about individuals, they tell about communities, they tell about families. And so when we, when we focus ourselves on an individual consent model, we, knock the knees out of the power of collective consent and collective control of these data types. And, and, and these data are so networked, there's no way to argue that an individual consent model I think is sufficient. And this is, here I am on my little soapbox, but like, I really, really feel that this, that for public health surveillance, we could lead as we think about these novel data types, we could really lead with this community consent conversation in a way that's very difficult in, um, in research because of regulations like the common rule, which are very individually focused. So That's a great point, Meg, and I, I couldn't have said it better myself. Thank you for bringing that up. I do think that it's also really important, and if Stephanie were here, she, you know, she might be able to, to say a little bit more about this, but the, the, you know, I started my public health surveillance career in the in the early days of HIV, where there was huge pushback about from from rightfully so from stigma from the you know people you know people with HIV getting their homes burned down and kicked out of every situation you could imagine. Um, so there was a lot of pushback around the government having surveillance data. Um, I would say again, channeling Stephanie, that the most important thing we can do as public health professionals who work in surveillance is connect with the communities who are affected by the, the situation or the particular um, you know, disorder or uh, behavior. Because if we, if, if we have to make sure that communities understand the role of public health and the role of public health surveillance. And the only way we can do that is the way we did that with HIV surveillance, which is we hoofed it out there and went to community meeting after community meeting in, in all the major cities in the US, many of the rural areas. And we talked to people about why this matters, why, how this will help, how we protect these data, how 
how communities and states, um, jurisdictions that, that collect these data protect the information, what CDC does with the data, what we didn't do with the data. You know, there's a lot of miscommunication or, or assumptions about what we do with the data or don't do with the data. So those are the kinds of conversations that I think affected communities must be at the table when we talk about these things. I, I really want to emphasize that as, as a key part of what we're talking about in public health. So and I'll, I'll just hop on the soapbox with, I think, both Meg and Lisa at this point, just to say that, and, and this has been a worry for me for quite some time, is that the technology conversation is seeming to drive toward an individual consent model that is more and more and more fancy. Um, as opposed to thinking about, uh, as opposed to thinking about everything that has been raised here already, which is that data have a social nature as well as an individual um, relevance, and that at some level, the and I don't want to say that the individual consent isn't important. I would I would put my epidemiology hat on and say it's necessary but not at all sufficient, um, and and I would take a, a a little step further, and maybe this kind of goes into the you know the past versus the the future in the public health realm i think it's not going to be sufficient in the future to go and have conversations with communities i think it's going to be really important to invite communities in and share the power and governance authority and and allow communities to help create the rules and um and frankly part of the issue is is allowing communities to tell the stories that come from data analysis and that's a little bit more of a research perspective than the, the surveillance where it might be a little more obvious what's going on. Um, but I think that the ability for communities to control the stories that are told goes a long way to making sure that there's there's buy-in there. I did wanna pick up on a couple other things. One, one is the, this question of the data that you need for public health surveillance and understanding. And I think I, I really appreciate um, Lisa's perspective on the, the narrowness that public health takes on this. But I would say in my jurisdiction at least, that became a problem in the context of COVID because the narrowness in the data collection efforts did not include race, did not include occupation. And I would actually argue that occupation should have been preeminent even over race. Although in the end, it's the intersectional experience of those things that was putting people at risk. And so there is a there's a not any more than you need, but in, in a different public health context, what you need has to be able to shift nimbly. And we're not set up to do that at this point. And then the last thing I, I will just say is, I, I do think that we need to acknowledge that there's so much potential and power in the kind of data that we have potentially available to us, but every bit of data that can be used for a good public purpose can also be used for continued stigmatization and oppression and so on. And that's really the reason. It's because it's this like dual nature of data that we need to make sure that we bring uh, public and communities along with us um, for the ride that we're on in the future. Yeah, Kim, I really agree with you. And and I liked I liked you pointing to the need for, uh, you know, for lack of a better descriptor, like community-based participatory research with big health data, right? We need to port over these CBPR techniques and community-based action uh, research techniques that we've really developed and are working um, in really powerful ways at local levels with small data to the big health data context. And I think that once we figure out ways to integrate communities in all steps of the research projects process with big health data um, will be will be better positioned to not fall into the traps of you know bad machine learning and bad AI and all the all terrible things that happen. Um, and again, Lisa, to your point about you know the very specific remit of uh, public health surveillance, again, I think that there's opportunity there um, of of continuing with the spirit of parsimony um, and adapting it for this new reality. So yeah, you both bring up a really good point that I think is worth reiterating, which is the idea of, of collecting the, only the data that one needs to achieve the public health purpose is that, that the data that one needs is determined by the public health purpose. So 
the data needed for influenza surveillance are very different than the data needed for um, you know, syndromic surveillance to look for signals in heat stroke in the summer. You know, those are very different data. And, and so we might need a whole breadth of data to, to look at for, for signals in our surveillance system. But, but the point being that what, what drives what is needed is the condition, the purpose, um, you know, we, we look at a very different set of data fields for, you know, sexually transmitted disease surveillance than we look at for syndromic surveillance to look for signals for bio, biohazards, for example. So it really has to be driven by that idea that um, what you're looking for, what you're going to, how you're going to use the data. So I, I think that's a really good point. I do want to make sure that it's clear. And I couldn't agree more that when we were dealing with COVID, we didn't have, we didn't, we weren't nimble to use your word to, to, to be able to say what we really need here is occupation. We, we don't usually collect that. And we, we collectively were like, whoa, I, how do we do this? Um, that is something that was one of the, the keys of governance is to have, you know, organized similar um, requirements about what kinds of, how we're gonna, we're gonna collect the data. So, you know, that we have um, common la language and common ways to collect um, occupation, for example, common ways to collect something like sex. You know, you'd be, you all know, and, and folks know that, I mean, the amount of time you, that you spend as an analyst recoding sex from one and two, zero, one, MF, male, female. I mean, we don't even have a common set of, of variables to say, if you're going to collect sex, do it like this. I mean, this is one of the things that I think um, has frustrated efforts to streamline, um, whether it's public health surveillance data or public health survey data or public health research data. It's just this, it's, it's really just uh, willy-nilly how people code data and how they collect it. And so to have some standards that we all agree on that we can say, plug and play, you're going to collect occupation in your, in your thing, here's what you use. You're going to, you know, and then leave some room for, for places to create their own adaptations. But we need some of that, that consistency in our variables. We, we can't ask for the amount of money we need to create the perfect system. So every step that we, we take to make a good system should be focused on efficiency and effectiveness in terms of not only the data collection, but the data storage, the data management, the data use. And so part of governance is really coming up with a system that is similar, that works across various platforms and, and, and needs. Yeah, yeah, I think, I think you hit a really good point there, Lisa, that housekeeping is a major <laughs> challenge when we think about big data, right? And, and, it's, and it's underfunded and it's so, I mean, talking about the adolescent, right? It's like walking into an adolescent's bedroom, right? There are dirty socks everywhere and there's like a half eaten apple and it's, it's chaos, right? It's chaos in the hour of John. So in, a, in addition to housekeeping and metadata and cleaning and curation and interoperability, we also, and we would be totally remiss not to bring this up, uh, need to recognize the lack of representativeness of our data sets. Our data sets do not represent all of the people who live in our nation equally. And this is true of our old data sets. And it is so true of our new data sets. And we're already seeing the harms of that lack of representativeness um, from machine learning um, and, and other applications. And so in addition to all of those housekeeping tasks, I would add to our housekeeping uh, the, you know, I don't know, decolonialization, the re-representation of our data sets so that so that we're really um, looking at the at the true diversity of the people that we're serving as public health um, researchers or officials or or researchers. Our results are only as good as the representation of the people who provide the data. And you know, in research, clearly that is a is a recruitment issue, and uh, among other things. Um, 
in public health surveillance, that has a lot to do with who seeks care, who gets an actual diagnosis versus who gets treated for things. I mean, there are a lot of things. And I, I agree that that needs some serious attention. Yeah. But, and also in the new data streams, like who owns a fancy yeah. oh, exercise watch, yeah. you know, yeah. and, and who has the fancy phone with the particular sensors that allow you to measure different things. And who has consistent uh, service on their phones and who has, yes. you know, a- adequate Yes, you know. which speaks to which speaks to when we think about policy, right. the infrastructure plan of the Biden administration and recognizing um, digital infrastructure as a piece, a critical piece of the infrastructure package in the United States. Kim, did you have a point you wanted to make? Because I saw you like starting to respond. No, no, I, I just okay. gonna, I was just going to agree with. Okay. Like, I mean, the rep- the representation piece is is big. Maybe the only thing I would add there is is. So- part of w- the way we'll deal with representation is through trust. Um, because that's one of the reasons that we don't have that entirely now. Yeah, and that's totally easy, right? I mean, it's like the easiest thing in the world to build that's trust. That's for the with. next hour of this <laughs> yeah. panel. I was hoping you would get to trust and, and what this is, you know, you know my, my head has been sort of swinging, like, you haven't seen it, my brain has been swinging like a pendulum between, so is the locus of action that we're looking for at a federal or even international level, we really haven't talked about sort of, you know, data sharing across territorial boundaries, right, we've talked a little bit, you know, and I think that you, you uh, Kim in particular, trying to raise the voice of, of you know, the indigenous uh, groups in the U.S. who had a very challenging time during the pandemic getting access to their own data. Right. And so there is this feeling of, uh, you know, data ownership as a collective and then being able to marshal that uh, to your local uh, public health response, not even getting at, you know, what do we owe each other internationally? I think this is coming out with, uh, you know, we're seeing the uh, supply chains. I think people have just been awakened to the complexity of supply chains over the course of this pandemic, not realizing like how interconnected that is with public health. Um, but I also recognize that we're at 2.49 here, and I promised that we would offer some time for, for questions if, uh, if there were from the audience. So um, please don't hesitate. I don't see any uh, currently in the Q&A, so um, but we'll give, leave that open uh, as a possibility. Uh, and maybe we can sort of talk for a couple seconds about trust and trustworthiness. Um, and maybe how it connects with, uh, with data ownership, how it connects with you know, engaging with um, groups to participate in research. I think Meg, that your research particularly speaks to that. Um, and what does it say for the sort of practice of governance? Well, I will just start out by saying we, you know, we have this saying in public health that you know, trust is our currency. We, we really cannot do anything without trust. And that means we as public health professionals and as the profession have to be trustworthy. And we have to know what that means in different communities, different, that, that means different things to different people. And so uh, one of our foundational values in public health is inclusiveness and solidarity. And so that means we have to ask people, what, what do we need to do to gain your trust? How do, how do we create um, a, a situation where you believe we're trustworthy? And I think that gets to exactly what we're talking about today is you know, people want to be sure that there is some system, some governance um, policies that, that the, the public health data system is not just hardware and software, that it's policy, it's building trust, it is, um, of course, it's protecting data, but it's also doing the right thing with the data communities, as, as Kim said, communities having a say in what happens with the results. I mean, this is all about what, you know, our foundational values are in public health. And in some instances, that means sharing data. And, and you know, WHO, I worked on a group um, that did a great um, uh, bit of work talking about um, sharing public health surveillance data and how important that is. And if COVID hasn't taught us anything, it has taught us that you know, the health of one person half a world away has an impact on the health of everyone else on the planet. And we have to be with, with the governance ideas in mind, the policies, the protections, we have to be willing and able to effectively share data in order to act. And that's really what public health is all about. Thank you. Um, so we have one question that came in for the panel. Um, how do we reconcile, this is from Sarah Nelson. How do we reconcile a community consent approach with the globalization and mobility point uh, that Meg made at the outset, i.e. how to scope and define 
the community. And this really resonates with me coming from the technology and public purpose project where I've been asking who is the public? Um, so how do we define the community when it's porous and time dependent? So great question, Sarah. So I would, I, I'll venture into this, this could be dangerous territory, but, but I, none of us belong to one community. So what we're talking about is multiple intersecting communities. It could be geographic, it could be hereditary, it could be um, social identification. There's so many different ways to think about communities. And when we're talking about um, community involvement and engagement and I stress the involvement, I, we're not, I think talking about that means that everybody in that community is involved. And the, the way I kind of been thinking about this is that there's a lot of social policy issues out there from climate change to data for public health to um, you know, fu the future of um, AI and all of those other things. And we can't all be interested and involved in all of those. So in some sense, we trust our fellow community members to help um, make some decisions that we can live with. So the, I think the importance here is the diversity of voices and the, the, the true um, kind of intent to share power with people who are outside the professional sphere. Um, I read a really interesting thing from Taiwan because Taiwan took a really quite technological based and interesting approach to COVID management. And one of the things that was expressed there is that we need um, the community to trust um, government as Lisa described, but we equally need the government to trust communities. And that seems to be a bit of a challenge that we haven't quite gotten over yet. Well, Kim, that's, I agree with everything you said, but that those are powerful words, the idea of government trusting communities. Um, that is really, I think, a lesson for our times. And what a democratic ideal, right? We, we want to be governed by uh, people we elect who are part of who we are. Um, isn't that exactly what, what, what we want is for our government to trust the people and the people to trust the government. It's the ideal that we are all um, you know, hoping for and, and continue to hope for as we do this work as, as you know, intended by our, our the founders of our country is really to, to have an active and evolving democracy. And that means we have to be involved. This, this ties into so many things, including education and civic involvement. Mm -hmm. And it's just, it's, it's, it can get big really fast, but um, mm -hmm. I, I think fundamentally that idea that, that we are governed by our, we are self-governed. This is what that, that idea is. Yeah, and, and, and in an increasingly digitized complex world where everything can be data and data are everything in some sense, isn't data governance essentially an expression of our democratic values and our democratic institutions? I love how far this conversation has come. <laughs> I'm like, I'm ready to pour a glass of wine and like, <laughs> stay here, stay here for all night. Right? So I know, yeah, I mean, I think I'm, I'm grateful that we've come around to this conversation about uh, democracy. That's certainly how I see it. And, you know, I see our public health responsibility in a very expansive way. And I think that's, um, I've been challenged over the course of this fellowship, trying to think like, you know, where is this locus of responsibility for the governance of public health data? Because it can be so many things. And we do exist in these uh, multi multitude of uh, communities. Um, and, you know, I think we haven't, I, I would have had to think of other panelists to bring on to sort of maybe elicit the shadow side of this. You know, I think one of you mentioned that for every good use of data, there are nefarious uses. Um, and, you know, the intersection there with, you know, who do we trust to have access to our data? You know, reading the sort of data governance literature these days, I see a lot of like this move to zero trust that we, we don't know where our perimeter is anymore. And so we really need to lock down and just not trust anyone. And how that meshes with you know, open data, data sharing, uh, our responsibilities to one another, uh, any kind of public purpose, that's something really hard to reconcile. Yeah, I, I would really push back against zero trust systems. Um, it is not through zero trust that we will build better, right? It is. It is through creating transparency and openness and auditability um, in our systems so that we have, um, you know, a, a flipped panopticum, 
right? So we so we turn we turn the watcher, you know, the the people being watched are now the ones who are watching. Um, and I think that that's really how we take a step forward with this is, is through greater public involvement, is through greater public transparency, is through greater public scrutiny. And maybe we we design that, you know, for altruistic purposes, you can donate your data and then you can't, you know, then you're protected from harm. Sort of like in New Zealand, if you go for a hike and you break your leg, you don't sue the landowner. There's just a public fund for people breaking their legs because accidents happen, right? Like bad, bad data uses will always happen. Some may be malicious, many may be accidental, probably many more are accidental. And so do, do, we, do we change the way we think about these challenges so that we promote the good rather than fight constantly against the bad. It's just, I think a very different, I, I just don't feel like we wanna go down that path. I'm joining team Meg. I really think it's important, um, just another way of saying what you said, Meg, is to, to really think about this as a way, as a calibration, right? There are certain data that just, we should not be all hyped up over. And there are other kinds of data that we want more protected. And, and we need to calibrate our, our governance and our response um, to, to those things. We've tried that a little bit with HIPAA and other ways to protect health data. But you know, I think there are a lot of health data that people couldn't care less if other people knew about them. Do I care if somebody knows I had a cold? Absolutely not. Do I, would I care if somebody you know, knew some sensitive information? Um, I, I might care more. Um, so I, I do think we have to think about this idea of data privacy and protection, you know, I, after kind of what Helen Nisbaum called, you know, privacy and context, that what the situation is matters a lot, and we have to um, calibrate according. Yeah, I think, I, I mean, just to, to augment what has already been said, um, we do have to keep in mind the there are consequences of not using data. Like it, Inaction is action in a different way. So it, it is not a, it is not the, the avoidance of the risk of bad data use does not avoid the risk of everything else that can come if we're not using uh, data appropriately. And and then I think you know this is where I think we should be thinking about putting technology to our purpose as opposed to technology driving what we're doing. Like get back in front of that part and and have technology help us create data visiting rather than data sharing solutions, for example, so that data can be governed and stay where the, the governance actually happens rather than um, moving around and then we're losing control over who has what for what purpose. So, I mean, there's lots more that could be said there, but I yeah. think it's, you know, putting technology to our purpose has to be the way forward. Yeah, yeah. And, and there's also an environmental consequence of constantly standing up new data sets, right? I mean, if we pool it and we control it, it's better on, an, on a number of different levels. So there's also an environmental component here. Sorry, Flavia, I know you want to close. No, but I love it. I, I wish this conversation could continue. And you know, we're right at time here, but I want to give you all an opportunity. If there are people in the audience who want to find out more about your work or follow along, where can people find you? Meg, how about you start? Uh, probably the easiest way to find me is on Twitter. I'm at Meg Dorr, just my first name, my last name. You can send me a note. Kim? Yeah, same for me. Twitter's probably easiest and it's at Kim Chesper, C-H-S-P-R. And Lisa? For me, I'm, I'm not on Twitter, but um, I think any kind of a basic search in Google Scholar with Lisa and Lee, you'll find plenty about my work. Yes, and I highly recommend it. Wide searches on all of these folks. They have tremendous bodies of work. I thank you guys so much for coming and spending an hour here today. And I look forward to what comes next for public health data governance in the 21st century. Thank you.